<laughs> there we go. Hey, well, there we are. We're live here. Welcome, everyone, to another wonderful episode of the Spoiler Room. You've come down the stairs. You grabbed your favorite drink. Pull up the chair, folks, uh, and put the scissors down. Don't go running with them because uh, you could you could poke someone's eye out with that. Well. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to talk about a movie, and we'll find out if my uh, crew member, who's joined me tonight, wanted to poke his eyes out after watching a Dead Again. 1991 is part of Deaduary. Yes, it's none other than uh, Mr. Ian Simmons. Hello, Ian. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm really interested to see what you thought of this movie, because while I was watching it, I there were so many times, and I nearly paused it, and messaged you something very specific about how i thought <laughs> how i felt about this movie yeah. but i held back you I held back. back you saved it for the episode saved all the juicy stuff for the episode i, I didn't want to pop that. any balloons with my scissors no that's <laughs> that's fine that's fine and we got a couple folks in the crowd tonight so glad you could join us raise a glass and since you're the only one here ian besides me you get to do the synopsis of Dead Alive. Uh, uh, Dead Again. Excuse me, I said Dead Alive. <laughs> Begins with an about, A. Okay. Can we talk about Dead Alive again? <laughs> no, we're talking about Dead Again, directed by oh, Kenneth Branagh. Damn it. Go, Mr. Ian Simmons. Um, all right. There's uh opens with murder and this overwrought score by uh who did the score in this movie? I, I took some notes. Uh Patrick. Doyle was not Patrick. Um, Maybe no, Patrick it. Doyle was a cop. Uh, it was um, he played a cop. Uh, no, yeah, Patrick uh, Doyle is a, he did the score as well. It was Patrick. Doyle. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, 1940s, 1949, December 10th. Um, this guy Roman is a Roman Strauss, played by Kenneth Branagh, who also directed the movie. He uh, is sentenced to death for the brutal murder of his wife. Um, played by Emma Thompson and he's on death row and he talks to a journalist, I think Andy Garcia. Yeah, he's a journalist. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be kind of fuzzy here, Mark, because I was so checked out of this movie from start to finish. Um, except when I would occasionally turn back to the screen, like seriously, what the fuck am I watching? Um, so this is going to be an interesting conversation. Yes. So this guy is on death row. He, it's all black and white because it's capital K classy. Uh, he's marching down death row. He pulls out a pair of scissors and goes to attack uh, Emma Thompson's character. And then he wakes up, but he doesn't wake up. It's uh, it's the the present 1990s. Kenneth Branagh is also this guy. Mike Church. Symbolism is very subtle in this movie. Uh, he's a <laughs> He's a private investigator <laughs> who gets called to an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage. Uh, Emma Thompson plays the modern day version of herself. I guess she's got amnesia. No one's around to claim her. So he is tasked with getting her out of the orphanage and finding out you know, where she belongs. They kind of fall in love and there's great mystery. There's a hypnotist uh, played by Derek Jacoby. Um, Emma Thompson's identity kind of remains a mystery. So Mike Church decides to name her, wait for it, Grace. Grace. Uh, past lives all converge, and then the movie ends, and I weep tears of joy. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is one of the worst written, worst scored movie by professionals that I love, respect, and admire all of their work except for this major major blight <laughs> on their on their filmographies i did not i could not believe that i was watching the people that i love be in this whatever this is <laughs> and i love this movie uh, yeah, that's great tonight <laughs> <laughs> and we're done folks that's it we're done for tonight that was that was a great conversation thank you so much uh we will keep it civil um you make all great points i'm not saying that this is a a a wonderful film in that respect i enjoy it quite a bit i will say i didn't enjoy it quite as much this time around watching it as i did when i first watched this when um, did you first see it 
Did you see it in 91 or, or close to when it came out? I saw when it first came out. I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it on video, but okay. I only, I, I saw it like a year after it came out on theater when it was in video. So uh, I had rented it either on K I either saw it on cable or I rented it and I dug it. Um, you know, it, it wasn't now it's, we're not, we're talking 91. So I was young. Uh, high, <laughs> I was in high school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I liked it. I liked the twist. Yes, folks, this is a spoiler room. And it, it, it you know, w- one of us will be uh, probably bloodied by the end. Most likely me at the end of this. No, just kidding. Uh, but uh, it is a spoiler, room, folks. Uh, you know, I like the twist where they did because he had seen the story because they talk about in- reincarnation, folks. They talk about the past lives. And that's the whole thing is half of this movie is flashbacks catching up with who's in you know the past lives of the strausses and this murder and the events lead up to it and who has been reincarnated as who um you know and karma is one of the themes in here and i liked the twist to where and they play it play it off on for most of the film on the gender swap of the um uh reincarnation I, I like I thought that that was the part that always stuck out with me in this film was that they went that angle, something I hadn't seen in a lot of uh, the, uh, you know, films that dealt with reincarnation, especially. Yes, in the I 80s. would argue for very good reason. It makes no damn sense. <laughs> I, I found it interesting. Uh, you know, interesting I, is a good word for it. But I mean, uh, seriously, they're going to come back looking exactly like the versions of themselves, but their spirits got swapped into other bodies. This is the plot of like several lame 80s comedies, but it doesn't make sense in a movie that is about like actual reincarnation. On top of that, there is a scene where Derek Jacoby as the hypnotist pulls out a magazine from the 40s in yes. front of Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson. And they're like, and it's a picture of Thompson and Branna as the married versions of themselves from the 1940s. It's like a big, because they're high society. He was a big deal composer and they're kind of like wealthy people. He was new money because his former wife had died, I guess, and left them a family fortune. Yeah. It is a big photo spread. You can clearly see the two of them standing next to each other. Kenneth Branagh had a goatee as, you know, Strauss, the composer. But in the present day, he's just kind of clean shaven. But it's a Clark Kent Superman thing where they're like, <laughs> oh, my God, look, Emma Thompson, it's you from 60 years ago. And no one at any point says, and look, it's you from 60 years ago, Kenneth Branagh. But, you know, we can't tell because you've got facial hair. What? Oh, yeah. A lot of facial hair. And, you know, the accent's gone. <laughs> you can't tell an accent from looking at a magazine, Mark. Damn it, you caught I'm me. I'm pretty there. sure if you, you had a goatee, I'd be able to say, wait a second, is that David Fowley? No, it's Mark Kotchak. <laughs> I do. I, um, our apologies to David Fowley. There's no <laughs> 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 you are you are far the better looking man. But uh and I say that uh yeah, anyway, take that any way you want. Uh, <laughs> and then see for me, I I don't know. Maybe I like the quirkiness of it. Uh, this time around, again, being me, being old guy in his basement now, uh, I did catch on it. And I think, I mean, this is Kenneth Branagh's second film. And you're right. He goes on. He's a direct. He's a he's got a film coming out now, Death of the Nile, which a lot of people have said, yeah, this film really shouldn't be as working as well as it does. But part of that is because of Kenneth, <laughs> you know, his directing to that for death of the Nile. Uh, Did you see his Cinderella, the live action one that came yeah, out like six years it. ago? It was amazing. It, it, for, for one of the Disney live action movies, it was one of the better Disney live action films for sure. I can't, I can't even think about it in the category of the Disney live action movies. It is right. so its own thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the, with the direction. Yeah, it did. It it definitely had to do with the direction, you know, and here he's still cutting his chops. This is only his second film where he's directing. He's also in front of the camera. But you could tell there were a lot of people who wanted to work with him because of the familiar faces you have in here who at the time were familiar faces. I mean, Robin Williams shows up for for a short bit and his character is his character was interesting. He was not. I, I love Robin Williams' short bit because he's a doctor that ends up uh, Kenneth Branagh's Michael Church. You uh, ends up tracking him down 
because uh, he's uh, he used to be a therapist and he he talks about also uh, reincarnation in that but uh, and, and it's for looking up I think it was a, a different person maybe but anyway he crossed paths with this guy who's now working in a, a, sh- a convenience store because he got his license pulled because he was caught sleeping with some women but what I loved about this is I'm like this is a different Robin Williams. This is just before we really saw him getting into the darker or the more dramatic stuff. I think if I remember correctly, cause this was 91, he was still, this is right. Yeah. This kind is, of, well, he, this was, uh, it was a couple of years after dead poet society. Right. I think this is the same year as the Fisher King. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this was right around, you know, this is kind of like him entering as, is tom hanks phase before yeah. tom hanks did <laughs> yeah where he's like yeah i'm a goofy comedic actor but i can also do really serious stuff and gain a lot of you know critical attention yeah i my problem with robin williams in here is not robin williams it's the rest of the movie because <laughs> no but i yeah my frustration the reason i hate and i mm-hmm. mean capital h hate dead again mm-hmm. is because there are a few different kinds of movies in here all well executed for what they are but they don't belong together there's a <laughs> sure. there's an absolutely brutal bloody scene with the reveal that you're talking about the big twist where it turns out the son of the maid who had been in love with the strauss character was actually the one who killed the wife and right. it wasn't so much the the sit with the bit where the kid's standing next to the bed and he pulls out the scissors because it's kind of goofy because it looks like his first stab as he stabs her in the butt yeah, I but, know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the the rest of it where it's like behind the the curtain the veil of the the four poster mm-hmm. bed and he's like, it's like it's seriously creepy psycho stuff. And you see the wonderful the hands drenched in blood grabbing the scissors like that's powerful stuff. And then you get uh, uh earlier in the movie, you have a really bizarre chase scene, wacky comedy with uh with Kenneth Branagh chasing down Campbell Scott and like shaking his fist and like you like no that doesn't work you've got you got kenneth brenna and all these like operatic moments of his weird thick german accent as strauss and he bears an uncanny resemblance to tom lennon i don't know if you're familiar with him but he was on reno 911 oh okay yeah mm-hmm. and he's done funny accents with that kind of like mm, kind of the, the post, <laughs> i'm close and you know it's like a combination of tom lennon and dr evil like none of it like if <laughs> If Brana had just made a serious contemporary noir mm-hmm. and stuck, I, I don't like the idea of like, oh, you can't have tonal shifts in your movie. You can if you know how to pull them off. And he just couldn't pull it off here. No, I, I totally get the tonal shifts. Uh, I I enjoyed it. I like the fact that the he directs the flashback scenes like old kitschy, 50s uh you know uh murder mystery of sorts but not not like the the like the b side like the b movie you know <laughs> he directs those in, in in such a way and i i like that where those are done in slightly different style than the modern time um you know and, and for me it w- one of the things that, that okay didn't sit well with me but i i like that mixture I, I i didn't mind the tone i think i just like the overall quirkiness of this film because it is as you mentioned it's this amalgamation of just stuff that you're just like wait what <laughs> okay yeah you, you know I, i'll just roll with it because i like these actors and and, and i kind of dig the the concept with the reincarnation but i will say Kenneth Branagh with an American accent is the same as watching you and McGregor try to do it. It just, your brain just short circuits and you, you, it's very hard. I'm like, you didn't need to do it. But you know, at the same time, it's just, I, I, that was the part to where it was like, he was delivering his lines much like when Ewan does an American accent. It's just like, you could tell, He's trying very hard. Don't get me wrong. He pulls it off. But at the same time, it just doesn't fit. <laughs> it doesn't. And I think part of it is because it's not so much an American accent as it is a non-British accent. Non, yeah, Because it's not of yeah. a particular like you can't. It's True. so flat. I mean, it's he's got personality. He's kind of like got that zip and almost like his girl mm-hmm. Friday kind of like rat-a-tat delivery. But you can't place him. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know where he's from in America. It's just not British. 
<laughs> and he pulls that off well. But it's it, the thing that drives you crazy is America is a melting pot, right? So you could fast forward to, you know, 1991 L.A. and have right. a British P.I. working in mm -hmm. the city. It's kind of like you can't have a character in a movie about New York and they'll say, hey, yo, Tony, what's going on? I'm from the Bronx. Oh. Oh, forget about it. What are you talking about? You know, Right. You can't have a movie set in the South. Everybody's talking like this and we're going to go down to the courthouse. No, you know, people are all from all over the place. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of films miss that point, though. I mean, there's been some other films, too, we've talked about here or that I've just seen on the big screen where I was like, there was no reason why you had to have that person try to do an accent. There was nothing about that character to where, and you're right here, church doesn't have to have an American. I mean, Kenneth Branagh did not have to need to cover up his accent in this, you know, uh, for it. Well, Emma Thompson too, though, doesn't she have an accent as well? Or, uh, uh, uh she, she did in the flashbacks, but in the modern, Right. Context, she didn't. She didn't. Right. And I think she pulls it off a bit better, but mostly because she doesn't. She has even less you know, lines because you know the first third of her performance, she's playing someone who's so been so traumatized say anything, she yeah. can't say anything. Right. Right. Um. Yeah. I look. The scissors are a big motif. I know this because are every they? time there's scissors <laughs> in the room. We like a character like looks over. It becomes a parody of itself. If I if I had known this movie was going to be like what it is, because I think I look at the poster. I'm like, oh, this mm -hmm. is like a serious Oscars contender wannabe from 1991 that I just mm -hmm. somehow missed. It's got Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson. I have a certain expectation going in. I think, oh, it's going to be a spooky mystery about past lives. No, it's like, I don't know, L.A. story you know, meets the happening or something like that. It's very <laughs> wow. strange. Uh, but like, okay. At the end in the climax, when we're in, I think it's, is it Frankie or Fred or whatever the kid's apartment with the, the old man, the hypnotist, it's not his place. Whose place? No, is it? it's hers place because it's they her discover place. because you get the wonderful character in here who is actually not playing an a-hole for once, which was wonderful. Wayne Knight as Piccolo Pete, who, He's in here for just a short amount of time, but at least he's playing a good, he's playing a happy guy for once. He's not playing, you know, someone, some snarky guy. He plays a genuine good guy in it. Um, he found out that Grace is actually a different person and they go to her apartment and they find out she was an artist and that after she uh, suffered a traumatic event, suddenly she's had all this imagery and that of uh, scissors and it's in all of her art, which she discovers once she comes to her apartment and realizes, Oh, look at my art. It looks like Edward scissor hands porn, you know? So, and not Edward yeah. penis hands. That's a different one. We're talking actual <laughs> Edward scissor hands. If you want to talk Edward penis hands, check out Astro radio Z, the porn parodies. There you go. Anyway. Um, well, it's, I understand she's an artist and everything, but, and I get obsession but you mm -hmm. know it's it's so over the top i mean the glass table has a you know open pairs of scissors as the legs at the end the thing that does in derek jacoby's character is kenneth brana while derek jacoby is jumping through the air in slow motion <laughs> kenneth brana like almost in real time <laughs> wheels around Post a cart that has this giant scissors you know, sticking out of it sculpture. sculpture it's a sculpture to impale mm. him i'm like what what is this movie <laughs> i don't know it's 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 a bizarre film but i like quirky bizarre films i'm not saying it's a, a phenomenal film no it's definitely over the top and that was one of the things that i noticed now versus when i watched it when it was when i was younger was just how over the top some of the the acting and scenes were, and and I did chuckle a little at them this time around. But still, I I enjoy it for its quirkiness. I think I enjoy it di differently this time than like when I was younger. When younger, I took it a little more serious. I'm like, oh wow, it just whoa, you know. I didn't notice a lot more things, but now watching it again, I go, I'm enjoying this, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> like, and that's that's the thing is i can understand watching this when it first came out uh and being especially watching it you know and as a teenager um because we were both around the same age we still are um but no you're a lot younger than i am so there you go that's a lot younger <laughs> no but but i can see because in 1991 
you're not used to seeing uh, you know uh, we mentioned a couple of movies that robin williams had been serious in at that mm-hmm. point, but I can imagine seeing him in this capacity is still kind of a surprise, right? It's almost like he plays almost a this is seems like a warm up to what he would do in Goodwill Hunting a couple of years mm-hmm. later, the the haunted therapist, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but and also the the mixing of the you know the the past and the present, and you know the mixing up of genres and stuff. I can see it being a very kind of creative stew. But mm-hmm. I would almost rather see Kenneth Branagh remake his own film now, but do it mm. straight. Mm-hmm. Because you you hit on something you know kind of profound with these flashbacks. Is they're done in the style of like 1950s movies. What he was trying to evoke, or what he should have been trying to evoke, is 1930s and 40s movies, like actual mm-hmm. noir. It's as right. if he were making the kind of movie that he thinks were being made back then, you know, like, oh, those cheesy old black and white movies where everyone's like hamming it up and overacting. There's a scene where Brana and Thompson walk into a big gala and they're doing that over exaggerated, like waving and pointing thing like, oh, look, there's there's my (laughs) friends. And it's like there's five people in the room. It's not like there's five thousand. Like, what are you doing? Don't don't forget the the part where they're describing the party and everybody at the party has has chosen to do a freeze frame type of thing but it's not actually a fr- freeze picture they're all just posing until the host comes out and goes let's have a party and then everybody starts moving again <laughs> i love that quirky no you're it, it doesn't pick a lane I, I fully understand your frustration with it because it. Uh, I, I will admit it doesn't pick a lane. I, I guess for me, uh, I just I get into it. But uh, Robin Williams, we keep coming back to it, but his performance really just it was just oh look, it's suddenly Robin Williams, and the way he's delivering his lines is similar to coked out comedy Robin Williams. But what he's saying and how he's portraying it and actually delivering it is in serious tone and you're like wow this is this is different for him you know it's so bottled up especially i think it's in the second scene where we Mm -hmm. realize i don't know if it's there but he when he gets into how he kind of fell from grace and ended up going from being a therapist to working at a convenience store didn't he didn't he use the word bitches or something like that like he's talking about the women that he was with and he felt he was talking about betrayal undercover an, an undercover bitch. That's right. It, it was so the, the way the women, he, Yeah. Yeah. The way that he delivers that, like you almost can tell, like he wanted to scream that word at <laughs> Kenneth Brown, but it just kind of keeps going. Bitch. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's scary stuff. And I would watch a drama or a detective movie with Kenneth Brown, even with his lame American accent, interacting with Robin Williams to try and solve a case. I would even watch, a wacky screwball comedy with Kenneth mm-hmm. Branagh and that flat American accent trying to solve a case because there is something kind of winning about this, you know, schlubby LA detective we've seen a thousand times, but I think he pulls it off really well. It's just that he's not really in a schlubby detective mm-hmm. movie. Like when uh, Emma Thompson is being hypnotized and there's like this serious flashback stuff and then we come out of it and then Kenneth Branagh is off to the side like, what, what does it all mean, Doc? What's going on? What, yeah. Is she going to wake up or what? <laughs> like it's, It really is Donnie Wahlberg in The, ha- in the Happening. <laughs> Donnie Wahlberg in The Happening. Yeah, it. Yeah, it is. I mean, he had a lot of experience acting and theatrical and all that going into this. But in all honesty, this if you look at it from like actual cinema, he hadn't been in a lot of like feature films and for him, even though he had been in a lot of TV shows and that, if you look at his credits, as far as feature films go, he hadn't done a whole lot. And for a young guy, because at this point, he's still young Kenneth Brana. He's 30. To, he, at, you know, well, for Hollywood, though, I mean, for, yeah. you know, uh, for what he was doing, he's taking on, I think he was also producer. You know, he's taking on like three roles and trying to act and be the main character. I mean, he's the main, the lead male lead in this. It had to be an awful lot. And I think maybe yeah. that does take a little bit away from the performance we're used to seeing from him because he's dealing with also the direction in that. And it might've been a little much for him at the time. And that's, and that's what I'm saying. Like uh, the, I say, I hate this movie. It's because I love so much about it. But mm-hmm. it, because I think it's it's pretty beautifully shot. 
I like all the the little kind of pockets and the different kinds of movies it is because I think it like each one of them works in their own way. They just don't work together. <laughs> and that's why I'm so checked out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I see where they're going and I don't really like it. So what's going mm -hmm. on on Twitter? <laughs> no, no, I get it. I mean, the 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 flashback story is compelling. I mean, the, the Strauss character, the way he plays it and Emma Thompson plays it, and everybody's performance done in the 50s style that's compelling and then those get interrupted with your modern time but that story as well and, and, I, and I get it that yeah each of these would be a great story on their own um you know for me I don't I, I like the amalgamation but at the same time I wouldn't mind I'd, I'd watch a full detective church story in the modern times where he's trying to figure out who she is and you know you still could do some of the the background stuff without necessarily doing the flashbacks, you could probably handle it a different way. You know, I, one person we haven't really talked about is uh, the big twist, as we mentioned, where Frankie, uh, you know, the young kid who did the killing is actually the guy who's been doing the hypnotizing of Emma Thompson and realizing who these people are. Derek Jacoby, I think puts it a very uh, fun performance in here as the hypnotist guy. He puts in, not quite Anthony Perkins style, uh, you know, uh, not quite getting that far with it, with being Norman Bates, but it, it is kind of Bates ish of sorts with it. And, and I liked it. I liked his performance in here. He was, you know, really great. And I think, uh, you know, when he shows up at Grace's uh, apartment or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, at right after she is shot, Mike Church, you know, in the arm or the chest or whatever, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, she comes in with the gun and she's like, I just shot, you know, Mike or whatever. Yeah. And he's like, he deli I can't remember exactly what he says, but he's like, oh, well, you saved me some trouble. And that's like right. when you when she realizes that he's the heel, it's a really nice reveal delivered very mm -hmm. well. The problem is th immediately preceding that was the scene between Mike and Grace in which a couple of problems let's break this down she's in the t at the top of this it might as well be a lighthouse it's it's uh, kind of like a lighthouse yeah a castle or lighthouse however yeah but it's it. also an apartment with like a crank yeah. elevator there's you don't see who is you know that she's alone in the place up at the very mm -hmm. top and you know there's a sense of urgency like mike has just figured out that he needs to get to her really fast but there's like a, a far away shot of you see someone approaching but mm -hmm. they're like walking, like really kind of menacingly, like, oh, this is where Derek Jacoby's character is going up to the lighthouse to kill Grace because he's figured mm -hmm. it all out. And at the same time, Mike is. So it's a race against the clock. But you see this deliberate character, like walking very deliberately, taking the elevator, getting up to the top. And then you realize it's Mike Church. And from a filmmaking standpoint, you're like, yeah, you're trying to make the audience think that she's in danger because the killer is coming after her. But really, it's the hero. But the way that character moves, there's not the same sense of urgency as when Mike actually, when she opens the door, he's like, oh, my God, you're never going to believe what happened. Like, what's with the walking slowly bit? That's, you know, yeah, that's why true. are you walking like a stalker? Um, <laughs> and true. then when she's like, there's that goofy scene where she's like freaking out because she thinks he's there to kill her. He's the killer. Yeah. Right. And like he's outside the window and she's inside and she's like dramatically shutting the drapes or the curtains <laughs> and like that. going all along the room like what is this bug bunny horse shit <laughs> i love that because i always love that trope of how people like they put the blinds down like that's supposed to stop people from actually talking <laughs> through the window it's not the first movie they do that often in movies and i'm like sitting there going wait wait they can still hear you. It's not like they put up a soundproof. You know, that trope is constantly used. I, I you know, I, yeah, it's one of those things where it, they try to make it to where they try to play it for a little while that you think Mike might be the killer or that, you know, she's freaking out and she killed, you know, uh, she thinks he's the killer, which again, Emma Thompson as well puts in a great performance in here as well. I mean, you buy into her trauma and her legitimate fear. She sells some of those seeds where she's supposed to be afraid. She's like going all in. <laughs> she's the only one who I think knows 
plays the movie as if it's the kind of movie that I've been describing, <laughs> like like a serious, <laughs> consistent right uh, performance. Yeah. And it's weird too because I'm used to seeing. I love Emma Thompson, but I'm I don't remember what the first movie was that I saw of her, but I'm mm -hmm. used to seeing her as an older woman and not like a 25 or 30 year old actress. Like, I mean, yeah. she was young and beautiful and cute. I mean, she's still a beautiful woman. But I'm not used to seeing her as it's kind of like Kenneth Branagh. I'm used to mm -hmm. seeing him as this older, you know, he's playing Poirot in the death in the Nile. I'm used to seeing that guy to see him with like a smooth face, you know, kind of baby face and baby? like, you know, you know, kind of hot young 30 something. I'm like, wow, this is weird. Yeah, and I'm I'm not just uh, saying it for you know joke wise. He reminded me a lot of a young Ewan McGregor the way he looked. In, yeah, very much so. In, in many ways, it's like wow, he really does look a lot like him. But Emma Thompson too hadn't been in a lot of actual feature films from here. Uh, you know, she had a few, but she was in Henry the Fifth as well with Kenneth Branagh who. Uh, directed that that was his first film so she you know i imagine that's why she came back was for this film with him i hadn't looked up too much on it but you know she had done a lot of tv and a few films so it, it it's interesting to see some of these actors who we know today as just being these huge talents in kind of their early feature you know i, I yes thomas and i know she had like three or four features and done a lot of tv but so did brana but as far as a feature almost every actor would tell you that's different than being in a TV show or something. So you bring a whole different level in. Yeah. It's interesting to see them ham it up more than what you might be used to seeing them do it. You know, um, I think th the one thing that got me this time, uh, because I still, I enjoy this film. I didn't hate this film. I, I, it, it, it ridiculous as well. We were talking about Moonfall, how that was like the ultimate ridiculous <laughs> film. You know, I like, I like ridiculous films if I'm entertained and I'm entertained by this one, but I will fully acknowledge as well. The, <laughs> there's a bit of, and these are two talented artists. Okay. I'm prefacing this. These are two very talented individuals who have gone on to just do wonderful things. But in this film, there is very little romantic chemistry between <laughs> Emma Thompson and Kenneth Branagh, unfortunately. When there's the Strausses, there's more. But when they're in the modern day trying to play, you know, Grace and Michael Church, it's not there. And maybe they're going for that on purpose as well. As we talk about doing something different with the flashbacks, you feel it more in the flashbacks, but definitely in the modern times, I never felt any type of chemistry between these two and their characters in the modern time when they kiss. I was like, why do I feel awkward? Cause this is the awkwardest on screen kiss. I've seen. I'm like, you guys put a little bit more into it. You, it's like you know kenneth said okay we're going to kiss in this scene and they get in front of the camera and they kiss and okay next scene uh <laughs> maybe maybe emma thompson had seen the dailies leading up to this and she's like <laughs> kenneth Brown, you're not as sexy as i thought you were when i signed on to this project i can't what are you what are you doing here guy <laughs> <laughs> if anything that's that's the one thing i didn't buy the modern characters the the flashback characters the strausses i bought their romance i i felt that that was good you know it again because brana is playing a different character the strauss character is far more you know artsy emotional you know very romantical if you will you know he he's more of that whereas michael church is more supposed to be like hey the straight pi guy who's got a drinking problem and can't keep his apartment clean you know so the, the, he's really trying to go for that separation between the characters but i i liked his strauss more than i liked his michael church i um, i'm kind of the opposite i think mm -hmm. mostly because i'd rather have the flat no accent than that weird you know bizarre <laughs> that's German true thing. Yeah. yeah because again he could be a guy named strauss who's an english composer Mm. you know why does he have to because the, the well that, that you lose the backstory you huh? lose the backstory of him escaping germany with the maid and his wife when they were trying to escape the nazis and going over the hill and that's how his wife died from a heart attack going up the hill and how the uh, maid and her son helped save him while he was in the mountains you missed that backstory. You, no, I, I I got the backstory. I just don't know if you've missed the fact that uh, you can come up with any other backstory that you want. 
and have it be <laughs> equally as compelling and still involve the maiden or son. I, th- true, true. Uh, he didn't have to be German, uh, but it was 1948, so they were playing the after the war <clears throat> angle because oh, let's sure. not let's not forget about our our. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. I like Andy Garcia. Okay, I like Andy. I, I like Andy Garcia. He's a really good actor. I have never seen him in a role to where he doesn't look like I just want to like squeegee and like clean his always looks a little greasy. I don't know why he just, he always has kind of a, a bit of a greasy look to him. <laughs> he does. And you know, that, that was sort of my first indication that there was trouble in paradise in yeah. that opening scene in the jail cell. When he kind of walks in, he looks like he's wearing Again, uh, let's make a film noir parody costume. <laughs> like yeah. he's got the the kind of the Panama suit. He takes off the hat. He's got like the floppy strands of hair, and you know it's just that well, that, the, that that full the, sequence. Like yeah. that's a fantasy sequence, but we don't really get that anywhere else in the movie. In the flashbacks, it's all straight. So I'm like, right? Because when he's when Brana is walking down the death row, and he's got the scissors in his sleeve, I'm like does no one else see what he has there? And then Emma Thompson is at the end yeah. and you know, she's all like, Oh, I'm like, why is he raising his, it's all fantasy. It's in his head. It's the nightmare. It, yeah. Right. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the mm. movie. I, I partially it's because I'm reading Stephen King's the green mile, which is also about death row. I'm like, there's no way this is getting, <laughs> this is happening <laughs> in, in, in a death row situation. This is just bad fantasy. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's why Stephen King's ruining the movie for you. Way to go, Stephen King. Way to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he wrote the Green Mile as a reaction to that opening scene of Dead Again. He's like, fuck you, Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it wasn't the scene from the player. But, you know. <laughs> I, I am going to turn in my critic card, Mark. I've yeah. never seen the player. What? It is a movie that every time it comes up in conversation, I'm like, I need to see the player. And I just never got around to it. I got to fix that. <laughs> it's probably one of the only Robert Altman films I actually enjoy. What? Oh, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to fault you there. I know he's a, he's a genius and everything. But yeah, I, I you know, for... killed myself watching Gosford Park. Like people you, are like, did... why are you trying to why are you trying to string that rope above the beam in the auditorium? Ian? I'm like, I hey. can't do this. <laughs> hey, I watched Shortcuts when it was on VHS. So it was two tapes that I had to rent and I had to swap tapes because shortcuts was so long. Uh-huh. Ironic, huh? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it ironic? <laughs> and at the end of it, I was like, what the fuck did I watch? What kind of movie was this? I'm like, it's a cameo star filled, you know, crossed stories type of film. But I just was not into that whatsoever. Dead I've again. not seen shortcuts either. I that's, You're not that's another blind spot. Yeah. You're not really. There's other critics who have praised it. And I'm like, you know, uh, yeah, uh, sure. Okay. You guys <laughs> enjoy that. You know, it filmed for me. It was just not the type of, of those, fil- you know, Magnolia's that type of film is the type of film I like. I just didn't get into shortcuts. It was just like maybe it was the fact that it was a button. I mean, like three and a half, four hour film. <laughs> Oh yeah. God! <laughs> well, it was two VHS tapes. Cuts. It was two VHS tapes. I think it was like three hours long or something like that. I think it's the runtime. But mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> Dead Again isn't that long. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure Ian appreciated that quite a bit. Uh, uh, no, th- this movie was eight and a half hours long. <laughs> it was a well for you. Yeah, it took you that long to watch it. Uh, Pretty much. Uh, me, you know, I, 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 I had no problems with it. Uh, you know, even with its quirks and that, I, I enjoy. It, but it's a quirky film. But getting back to uh, um, getting uh, back to Andy Garcia, yes, his his character, I see where you're talking about, and I would have loved to see. They they could have made just a movie about the Strausses and you know the reporter and how Strauss had this running jealousy with the reporter, and you know Emma Thompson's character really didn't have feelings for the reporter. Maybe she was kind of trying to ignore the fact that this guy was lusting after her. Like he immediately fell for her. Uh, It knocked him out of his hangover. Uh, You know, there's a compelling story there. Uh, You could have done just the whole movie on them. 
and it, I think would have been interesting. Yeah, it's almost like a noir take on The Great Gatsby or something. Yeah, um, you know that that would have been cool to watch. But the other, my God, when they go into 1991 times and Mike Church goes to visit Baker, the Andy Garcia character, uh, and it's, he's got the old man makeup. <laughs> I swear he looked, he's got like, he's all powdery and flaky. He looked like grandpa from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. <laughs> he did. I loved it. I loved it. He did. And I loved the gimmick they did too with the, uh, with the hole in his throat because of, of throat cancer. He had the hole where, you know, he, uh, he talks, he has to talk with the voice box because uh, his voice box, because of cancer, it, it, it had surgery to remove it, but he can't talk without, you know, the little, the, the robotic sounding device. And mm -hmm. so he's got the hole there and he asks for a cigarette. And he finally, uh, you know, Michael Church gives it to him and he does the whole smoking through, <laughs> through the hole. <laughs> Something we've seen a number of times before this film came out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Infobomb is with us, Robert Infobomb, and he goes, he saw shortcuts <laughs> in the days of the now Paleolithic medium known as VHS. He saw it as well, the dual videotapes. Yeah, uh, the dual videotape epics of Sand Pebbles and The Great Escape. Uh, Ian was looking for The Great Escape when he watched <laughs> this movie. Did, did you... Were there some there were some things you've mentioned, though, that you did enjoy. You just wish they hadn't all been in one film. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think uh, Schindler's List, Star Wars, The Force Awakens and Hellbound Hellraiser 2 are great films in their own right. They just don't belong in the same movie together. Like if someone tried <laughs> to put those all together in one film, I'd be like, no, just oh, stop. Yeah. Pull over well, and shit, now, your life. Now I want Darth Maul to be Pinhead. OK, thanks. Now that's now I want that to be a thing. Oh, look at that. You thought about it for a minute. Well, no. Now I'm thinking. I think they already did that movie. It was called Event Horizon. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I love me Event Horizon. That movie's fucked up. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if Schindler's List quite <laughs> crosses over yeah, into that that mix up, I, but you know, I could find it. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Schindler's List, Hellraiser, and The Force Awakens. Man, I want to <laughs> see that movie now. I'm, I'm writing it in my head, and I'm like, this is just. This is going to compete with Moonfall, let me tell you. Uh, it's going to be called the uh, Hellbound Schindler's Force. <laughs> Hellbound Schindler's Force. <laughs> uh, Hellbound Schindler Awakens. What? No. Uh, <laughs> what is he, a zombie? <laughs> He's a zombie now. Sure, why not? <laughs> Comes back from the dead to expand the list. I can get on board with that. <laughs> there you go. See, exactly. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's lee it was liam neeson he's doing all these direct-to-video movies he's yeah, that's gonna be his next one it's his next one you know and you have a nazi who who uh <laughs> no he uses he uses the puzzle box to open up the gates of hell so he can get bars. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, we need to stop before we both get canceled. <laughs> before we get canceled, yeah. Uh you know, for his early work, I mean, you can see his talent in here, Kenneth Branagh's talent in here. I think part of the reason why it's amalgamation and as you mentioned through uh, probably not so much rose color eyes as myself cuz I watch this at a, an impressionable age and and you know, even for its warts and all, I I enjoy it. Um, it was a lot for him to take on. And I think that's very evident in yeah. this film, you know? And that's why I say, I, I like a lot of stuff that, that is going on in here. And I do, I don't envy the man. I mean, this is, it's a Herculean effort to try and take on. I think in a lot of ways he was doing stuff 30 years ago that people, I think kind of improved upon in the mm -hmm. subsequent decades. I just don't think it kind of works. <laughs> And see, it, it does work, but for different reasons. I just I find a lot of entertainment in it. Um, technically, yeah, it is it is a bit all over the place as far as what they wanted to do. They've got a lot of great ideas in this film. Some of them come to fruition. Some of them they pass by real quick and you'd like to revisit, but you'd not. There's a there's an interesting story in here, even between uh, the uh, mom and, you know, our uh, and Frankie. 
you know, a, there's an interesting relationship there. <laughs> I love that final scene because it's full of so much suspense where the mom tells Mike Church the whole deal about the cover up, how she protected her son. And then he leaves and immediately Frankie steps out of the shadows and he's like, it's OK, mom, I'll, I'm going to help you to bed. And then he kind of tucks her in and then he smothers her to death. They both know what's about to happen. Right. The but mom, what, I yeah. what I love is that you kind of think, OK, maybe the mom's going to you know, accept being choked to death. But you still you know, are smothered, but you still hear her like kind of scream and struggle under that pillow. But it's the reality of that situation. You know, your, right. your body, no matter how much you're resigned to it, is still going to mm -hmm. freak out and go into that instinct mode. And they don't show the whole, you know, murder. You, it's kind of left your imagination, but it's kind of a creepy and touching scene. It's very well done. Again, doesn't belong in the same movie with Campbell <laughs> Scott, you know, wrestling with uh, Kenneth Branagh in L.A. in the daylight. <laughs> Oh, come on. Brado was kicking it, though. He was booking down that street. It was like... He speaking must have of, <laughs> speaking <laughs> of kicking, didn't Campbell Scott roundhouse kick? Uh, yes, kind of he does martial fight? arts. Like, out of nowhere, he could he confronts this guy, and the guy does a couple of Cobra Kai moves and does a spinning roundhouse on him and then jumps over <laughs> and jumps down the bridge and over a fence. And, and runs away, who you find out later he was just an actor hired specifically by Frankie so he could try to get uh, Grace away from Michael Church. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Cinema Gold. It's just Cinema Gold. We got, we got Robert Bob here who said he thought Event Horizon seemed Hellraiser-ish. Oh, yeah, it is, of course. And the darker version of The Black Hole, of which if you look at it, the eyes of adults, simply not eye candy. It's a very dark film. Oh, yeah, we yes. covered The Black Hole on our podcast a while back as uh, one of those dark Disney films when yes, folks in the early eighties, Disney was on the ropes financially. Uh, I know it's hard to believe. I don't know. They're the mega giants, but they were, and they were starting to make more mature films under the Disney name. Black hole was one of them. I love black hole. It's a, that's another bizarre film. That's just shouldn't be for kids, but it's Disney, right? And then he goes, if you want a less entertaining versions of Dead Again, uh, see the canon film Deja Vu. <laughs> of course, the names Jacqueline Smith and Emma Thompson should never be said in the same sentence. <laughs> this is very true. Um, you know, and I think for me, that's the appeal of this film. Uh, in different eyes, for my different eyes, the way I look at it, it's fun watching these people, and we'll wrap it up here, the people that we've known and grown and seen them blossom and flourish and, and become very talented folks see them in an earlier feature film like this and seeing the you know uh doing the best with what they're given uh with this and everybody taking on a cast you know a, a role that you're not maybe quite used to seeing them in and just uh, cutting their chops you know I mean, this is let's put it this way though what's interesting is this is written by the same guy who gave us, <laughs> prepare yourself, Logan. He wrote Logan. Another movie I despise. Oh, well, see, <laughs> at least you're consistent. Yeah. You're just yeah. not a you're just not a fan of this guy then. Yeah. Well, he also wrote Minority Report. So there you go. If you didn't like Minority Report. Uh, no, I, 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 I liked part of Minority Report. I'm actually going to be <laughs> watching that again this year for the 20th anniversary. 20 oh, years. Oh, yeah. thanks. Now I feel old. I didn't feel I <laughs> if I didn't feel old before. Now I feel old. Thanks. That's what I'm Thank here for. Thank you very much. I but you know, uh Tom Cruise still looks the same. So I, I don't know how it happens, but he does. It's bad when you see trailers for Maverick and you go, wait, is that a scene from the original film? And you're like, oh no, no, that's more recent. Okay, he's just got a few more lines on his face because for whatever reason. Uh, <laughs> and one final comment from Robert Bobby he mentions the black hole was just over edited it was curious touchstone for Disney by the way Thompson appeared with Christopher Reed in Remains of the Day and Smith co-starred with Reeve in the TV film Nightmare in the Daylight yes uh, <laughs> always seems to come back to canon at some point 
<laughs> when you're talking 80s, early 90s films, there's always some kind of canon connection. So I love the name of TV movies, Nightmare in the Daylight. <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> the ti- t- TV movies, man. The, the the titles they just like grab a like a Mad Libs and, and just try to write write a Mad Libs. <laughs> I hope whoever named that film got half a million dollars just for that act of heroism. Mm-hmm. Nightmare in the Daylight. <laughs> wow. We'll we'll close it up here with a few uh, tidbits of trivia, a la IMDb. Uh, apparently the movie was shot all in color, but while they were editing it, they chose to put the flashbacks in a uh, black and white. Uh, so, and you were right. This was the same year as the Fisher King and another very scary movie hook. Uh, sorry. <laughs> wow. That's that, Robin Williams. Just, he was on fire. He was on, he was on something when he did hook, (laughs) when he did hook at least. I'm sorry. Uh, (laughs) uh, The Covenant is the same building that was used for the exteriors of Bruce Wayne's house in Batman 1966. So there you go. So that's Um, it. It's also um, Kenneth Branagh had the, the, (laughs) this was uh, kind of the final middle finger uh, the last real shot of the movie, aside from like the the kind of the kissing montage, whatever it is, uh, they go back out to the the iron gates of that house where you see the clef, you know, symbol yes, on the, the gates, yeah, the, yeah, which recalls the opening and closing shots in black and white of Citizen Kane. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth Branagh, thirty years old, which I think might have been the same age as Orson Welles around there when he did that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're saying? Well, well, I'm sorry, but I knew it would eventually happen that we would pick a movie that you would you would just regret watching. So it finally I don't Two regret years. watching it. No, okay. I don't okay. regret I don't, don't regret watching any movie. The experience might be torture, but I always learn something. <laughs> well, you get to see where he came from, at least. And, and yeah, where some I other learned films, that I you know. I learned that I wanted to see, I want to see him remake his own film with 30 years of experience and other movies kind of like it and see what he would do. If he remade it as the same crap, then I'd be like, eh, you maybe you haven't <laughs> learned your lesson, but if he came out with something amazing, I'd be like, well, I'm all there for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and for me, not quite as endearing as it once was, but I still enjoyed it quite a bit. It's just fun seeing these folks early on in their careers um Mm -hmm. you know that's why i like going back to these early films and that it is looking at where they've come from you know and seeing how they've grown and and you see some of those morsels occasionally those hints of talent sometimes are more prevalent than others uh but they learn you know and it's always fun to watch filmmakers especially like thompson and brana you know uh, grow and, and where they went to and like you mentioned this is just fun seeing robin williams in his early days of i'm not just happy manic guy on stage i can do other things you know i was floored with his fisher king you know you know fisher king for me i was like wow i'm like that that's robin williams in a whole new light (laughs) it's like well naked you uh, can see the full body sweater well okay well there's that maybe if I want to see that, I don't know if I want to see that. He's a you furry saw, guy. It's in the Fisher King. Yeah, that's true. Dance, yeah, yeah. You saw him in a whole a, new light. The light of yeah, the park at night. The, the light naked. of the park at night. <laughs> naked. Yes. <laughs> All right, Mister Ian Simmons. Well, since the Oscars nominations have been announced, uh, I'm going to give you an Oscar. We're going to end tonight on a little bit of a note, and just for the hell of it, just because we're going to do a little trivia. All so, right. Uh, it's not going to work for me because, uh, unfortunately, they don't put the answers on one side and the question on the other. Otherwise, I could play as well. They question and answer on the same side. So I can't play with you here. Um, but we're going to pick a card, uh, Oscar trivia here because Oscars are coming up. So we're taking from the Oscar winners category of Whee. the big movie quiz that my wife got me. Hey, I got to put this thing to use somehow. I just read the questions to myself. I like, oh, look, there's the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, here, you pick one or two. 
Number two. Number two. With which movie was Sylvester Stallone nominated for Best Actor in 1977? Oh, uh, Rocky? There you no. go. What, was yeah, that 77, yeah. really? Wow, that was okay. 77. Yeah, I know. It makes me feel old. You want the other question that's on here, too? You'll probably get sure. this one. All right. Who famously mispronounced Idina Menzel's name at the 2014? John Travolta. Academy? Yeah, Steve, there you go. Adele Dazim. Yeah. Adele, uh, 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 yeah, Adele. <laughs> <laughs> not as not as good not as good as the ultimate the ultimate fubar a few years ago in oscar history where they read the wrong best picture category <laughs> where it was la la land no 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 moonlight then they have the entire cast of both films up on stage and nobody really knows what to do warren betty looks like he just wants to go crawl in another bottle uh <laughs> And I still maintain they read the right card. <laughs> See, and there's going to be a film that we may disagree on because I think La La Land was overrated. But I mean, you can have that opinion. It doesn't mean that you're right. Anyway, <laughs> you can have that opinion of that again. Doesn't mean you're right either. Oh, we got Robert Baum. He wants to play. Okay, Robert. Baum. All right. All right. We'll get Robert in here. Robert, we'll give you we'll give you one for the night. We'll close it out. And folks, if you're listening to the podcast only version, tune in to our live action and maybe you'll be able to play a little trivia as well. OK, Robert, I know we've got a little lag here, but uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to give we're going to have Ian pick the question for you uh, because that's, you know, we're co-hosts. So pick one okay. or two, Ian. One. Change one. A bit. OK, this one is for Mr. Robert Infobomb. Uh, always love when you tune in, sir. You always drop some great information. So here's your question. For which movie did Al Pacino win his first Academy Award? Ian, I think, knows this one. We'll, we'll wait. I know there's a little lag, so we'll wait. Meantime, he shared a tidbit. He said, <laughs> yeah, those Scientologists are geniuses. Liz, Tyler, uh, Liz Taylor was equally sharp when she read the answer to the Golden Globes one year. Or did she say the winner before the envelope was open? I, <laughs> I think I remember that. I think I remember that. So, uh, yeah, the question again, for which movie did Al Pacino win his first Academy Award? It was a movie I haven't seen. Whoa. So, yeah, oh, there you go. Hey, look at that. Robert Baum got it. Scent of a woman. Very good. Follow, follow up question. Here we go. Uh, ben Kingsley. Won the night. Oh, the come on! The 1983 Academy Award for Best Actor for his portrayal of which historical figure? We'll give him a little time there, and yeah, all right. So that one, I don't know who wrote these. I tell you, they're giving you the easy ones. No, just <laughs> it should have been Serpico. Yeah, they should have given it to. They should have given Serpico uh, a Best uh, Actor to. Mr. Al Pacino, I would have liked to see that. But Gandhi, yes, hey, see, he is in truly the Robert Info Bomb. He is full of knowledge. We appreciate everybody who tuned into the live. We're gonna wrap it up tonight. But of course, before we go, hashtag license to shill. This is where I give my wonderful, patient, and always coming back for more, Mr. Ian Simmons, co-host here, a chance to shill his stuff. So please, sir, the floor is yours. Um, well, first I want to mention, I just want to see Ben Kingsley as Serpico. <laughs> anyway, my name is Ian ben Simmons. Kingsley now. Ben Kingsley oh now plays as an Serpico. undercover cop. <laughs> as an undercover cop. No one, no one would suspect him. No. <laughs> wow. Um, all right. So I'm Ian Simmons. I run Kicking the Seat, which you can find at kickseat.com. I also have a YouTube channel, which is uh, Kicking the Seat on YouTube. And um, yeah, we do uh, movie reviews and live streams and interviews and all that good stuff. And we have, I think, a little bit of all of that uh, this week. So mm -hmm. uh, come check us out and uh, happy to have you. And I'm also here every Tuesday, which is the, one of the highlights of my week. <laughs> Well, I I am sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, your <laughs> life your life gets better. No, um, but, wow. <laughs> and this week is actually a full week for us here on Special Mark Productions. I've got three interviews dropping, so look for those later this week. I've got a written review now over on We Live Entertainment. Uh, two of those interviews and the written review are for a indie 
little indie sci-fi comedy uh, called The Second Age of Aquarius uh, with music written by the gentleman who co-created and wrote the uh, composed the music for Repo the Genetic Opera. So Darren Smith, I'm talking to him this week. I'm going to be, if they let me in, or if he forgets to lock the door, I'm going to be on the Book of Boba Fett final episode uh, with <laughs> Earth's Mightiest Critics. Uh, and I've got an interview dropping. One of the three interviews will be with the director and actor of Those Who Walk Away, a new indie film that's dropping this week as well. Uh, that's going to be a short interview, uh, but still going to be cool to do and whatever else I come up with this week. So, you know, not busy at all for our slate. So look for all of that. By the time this drops, all of that should be live and on the channels. Thank you so much, folks. And I would just say a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>